I've got a newspaper article here that I cut out of the Fresno Bee. This actually uh, is dated June 16, 1991. It's the story of a family in Hanford, right around the corner from us, Bill Hoffman's and his family. They were on vacation in Cheyenne, Wyoming, driving down the road, and a drunk driver lost control of his car, slammed into their car head on, and killed Bill Hoffman's wife and three children. Let me read to you a few clips here. Uh, Hoffman's has endured more than 15 major surgeries, the loss of several square feet of his skin, dozens of pints of blood, two inches off his left leg and most of his left knee, and bone grafts from both hips. He had first degree burns over 40% of his body and uh, badly mangled legs and suffered a critical loss of blood. Okay, can we uh, put the, there's, now, now you're looking at this same newspaper article that I'm looking at. Let me read from page two. On the wall across from his bed is a photograph of his wife, Elise, 37, and his three children, Ashley, five, Linnea, four, and William, Jr., one. The photo was taken one week before the accident. You can see it down there in the lower right. I know they're in heaven, he said, and I would be there with them if there wasn't a reason for me to be here. I don't know exactly the reason I'm here, but God will show me. Believe me, I wouldn't be able to go through this without the strength of God. After the accident and losing my family, I've had a lot of time on my back to think. The most important things in life aren't money, wealth, power, or even your physical body. The most important thing is knowing Jesus Christ in your life and witnessing about him. The van erupted in flames, killing everyone except Bill Hoffman's who survived because a passerby pulled him free. The driver of the other car was also killed in the crash. I've never hated him, Hoffman said of the drunken driver. Wow, if God's grace can prevent Bill Hoffman's from bitterness over a thing like that, then I would say there's no excuse for any bitterness you and I might feel in, in our lives today too. P because today is Mother's Day, I'm teaching about one of my favorite mothers in the Bible, Hannah. She was the mother of, Sa of Samuel. We read in chapter one, verse six of 1 Samuel, her husband had another wife who provoked her bitterly. Notice that word bitterly. And the result in verse 10, in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept, there's that word bitterly, bitterness again. So Hannah felt deep-seated bitterness, but she took some steps with, with the Lord to overcome her bitterness. Maybe you feel bitter today. Your marriage partner left you for someone else. Or you went into business with a friend and that friend drove you into bankruptcy. Or a family member came down with cancer and you begged God to bring healing, but you saw your family member suffer and die, and now you're bitter. Well, in our story today from the Bible, we're going to see how Hannah took three steps to move out of her bitterness into God's blessing, and these are the same three steps that you and I can take today. Here's step number one. Let your trials drive you to prayer. We read in verses one and two of 1 Samuel 1, there was a certain man whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. That was Hannah's trial. Now your problem might be exactly the opposite, that you have children. And at times you'd like to say, here, Hannah, you can have my kids. But this was no laughing matter to Hannah. She would have said amen to what Solomon later wrote in Psalm 127. Children are a reward from the Lord. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver 
is full of them. Hannah's quiver was empty. And twice in this passage, we get the exact same words. In verses five and six, the Lord had closed her womb. And again, the Lord had closed her womb. I think it's safe to say that God was not punishing Hannah for some secret sin. The author portrayed her as a godly woman and no sin of hers is mentioned in this or any other passage. Well, why then did God close her womb? I think God wanted to teach Hannah total dependence on him. God was showing her that her only hope of motherhood was found in him. If Hannah's greatest goal in life was going to be fulfilled, the power would have to come from the Lord. Ironically, the woman with all the children was the immature, selfish, and insensitive Penina. I feel sorry for her kids, but Hannah, who would have made a tremendous mother, had no children. If I had been God, I would have given all the children to Hannah and deprived Penina of the blessing of motherhood. But God did it the other way around. It goes to show that we'll never really understand many of our trials. And if we could understand them, then our trials would no longer be trials of faith. The mystery of why God blessed Penina and made Hannah barren illustrates that we can't judge people by their outward circumstances. The bitterness Hannah felt from Penina's mockery was an ongoing problem, not an isolated incident. This comes out in verses seven and eight. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Well, like most of us husbands, Elkanah just didn't get it. He was trying to make his wife look on the bright side, but he only intensified her problem. Instead of nagging and interrogating her, he should have cried with her. She needed his compassion, but in essence, Elkanah told her to snap out of it, and that's the best way to sink a person deeper into the mire. A somewhat backward farmer came over to his neighbor's house to tell the neighbors that their son was stuck in a mud hole. The father of the boy asked the farmer, how deep is he sunk? And the farmer answered kind of lazily, oh, about up to his ankles. And the father said, well, he's sunk only up to his ankles. Come on in, we'll have a glass of lemonade, and then we'll go uh, and pull him out of the mud hole. And the farmer said kind of lazily, I don't think so. He's in head first. <laughs> and maybe that's how you feel today. You're up to your ankles, and you're in head first. And if you are that way today, at least you can sympathize with Hannah, because that's how she felt. Many who are stuck in the pit of depression decide to take their own lives. Others retreat into an emotional shell, and still others lash out bitterly against God. But Hannah was different. She allowed her trials to drive her to prayer. Verse 10 shows us that. In bitterness of soul, there it is again, that word, bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. Bitterness then had penetrated all the way down to Hannah's soul, but she took it all to God in prayer. She could have had a shouting match with Penina, she could have lost her temper with her husband. Or she could have resented God who had closed her womb. But those responses would have made her trial go to waste. Hannah put her problem to good use by letting it drive her 
to her knees. When one of our three children rebelled against the Lord in adolescence, it drove Mary and me to our knees. And for four or five years, we were down on our knees every day begging the Lord to restore uh, our daughter. And God performed a wonderful miracle. She did come alive, recommitted her life to Christ. We're so grateful. The last couple of months of last year, 2016, and the first couple of months this year, sent some shockwaves through our church family regarding our church's future. Well, what did I do about that? I'll tell you what I did about it. I marched around the perimeter of this church property, five and a half acres, three or four times a week for six months, and prayed, asking God to uh, send us fresh blessings from heaven right here uh, on this church. Whatever trial you are in today, don't let it go to waste. Even if you're still bitter, do what Hannah did. It says, in bitterness of soul, she cried out to the Lord in prayer. Let your trial uh, drive you to the Lord in prayer. Now let's look at the second step Hannah took to deal with her bitterness. Trust God through your trial. In Hannah's prayer, the accent is on trusting God, not just for the birth of a son, but for his entire life. We read in verse 11, and she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Hannah prayed for just one son, yet she was willing to surrender him to God. She longed for the blessing so she could place it at the feet of her heavenly master. Hannah called herself here the Lord's servant. Unlike Penina, she did not desire a son so she could mock other women who were barren. Nor did she wish to throw a counter jab at Penina as if to say, she who laughs last, laughs best. Her only desire was to yield her greatest treasure to God, and that proved her faith. The story continues in verses 12 to 14. And she kept on praying before the Lord. As she kept on praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Eli, the priest of God's people, rebuked a godly woman when she was praying. How insensitive. Our high priest, Jesus, never misunderstands us. He never discourages us in prayer unfairly or rebukes us for it. Eli added to Hannah's burden, but Jesus lifts our burdens. Hannah was quick to explain to the mistaken priest in verses 15 through 18. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. This is another example of Hannah's trust in God. She brought her burden to the Lord and left it there. Eli did not really give her absolute assurance that God would answer her prayer. He merely said, may the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. But that was all Hannah needed to hear. Her face lit up with joy. 
She was now trusting in her generous God to give her the son for whom she had prayed. Here is one of the Christian classics, the Confessions of Augustine. Maybe you've heard of Augustine. He's usually referred to as Saint Augustine. He lived in the fourth century AD. Rather than read the story, I'm gonna trim it down to size and just tell you one of the stories that comes out of this book. When he was a teenager, Augustine had a mistress and she bore him an illegitimate son. He left his mother's godly home to move in with this young woman. His mother's heart broke. Her name was Monica. Monica was unconcerned about the shame on her own reputation. All she cared about was her son's eternal welfare. Augustine then joined a cult. And as his contempt for his mother's Christian faith grew, so did Monica's prayers for her son. But for 14 years, Augustine continued to harden his heart against God and her mother, who was devoted to God. Finally, Monica begged a pastor to talk to her son and refute his errors. But the man of God replied that Augustine, her son, was unreachable. He says, I, I know Augustine, I, I've heard of him. He's unreachable. Monica refused to accept that. And then she shed a flood of tears in front of the pastor for her son. Seeing that, the pastor told Monica, go your way and God bless you. It is impossible that the son of these tears should perish. Monica accepted those words as if they had been God's voice from heaven. She left encouraged and felt renewed in her hope that her son would give his life to Christ. And he did. And more than that, Augustine became perhaps the chief theologian between the Apostle Paul in the first century and Martin Luther in the 16th century. God honored Monica's faith. He also rewarded Hannah's faith here in our passage, verses 19 and 20. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now some people, if they had been Hannah, would have told the Lord, hey Lord, remember that prayer request I uh, gave you about how I needed a son? Well, don't worry about that anymore. The problem solved itself. My infertility is finally over. No, Hannah was careful to give God the credit for answering her prayer. The name of she gave her son, Samuel, literally means asked of God or heard by God. Every time she would call her boy in for lunch, it would remind her that God had given him in answer to her prayer. True to her word, Hannah fulfilled her vow. In verses 24 through 8, we read, After he was weaned, she took the boy with her and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh and said to Eli, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Try to imagine how difficult this must have been for Hannah. Samuel was barely weaned, about three years old, and his mother would not be bringing him home again. We read over in chapter two, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Also in chapter two, we read that they even committed adultery in public. And it was their father who would be raising Samuel. So Hannah might have said, Lord, you know, when I made that vow that 
if you'd give me a son, I'd give him back to you and he'd stay here at the Lord's house. I didn't realize what a terrible father Eli would be. You've got to understand, Lord, that I cannot leave my son under the care of Eli, that terrible father. I've got to take him home with me again. But she didn't say that. She knew in her heart that she was giving Samuel to the Lord, not to God. I mean, to the Lord, not to Eli. God would have to watch over him in spite of Eli's negligence. That is faith. A woman once received the shocking news that her husband had just been killed by a drunk driver while he was walking across a street. That new widow's pastor showed up at her home and unloaded all of the seminary textbook answers to the question, how or why could God allow your husband to die like that? And after he was done, this wife, new widow, looked her pastor in the eye and said, Pastor, I, I don't need a God like that. I don't need to understand this. What I really need is a God who is bigger than my mind. Hannah had a God who was bigger than her mind, and that was okay with, with Hannah. And she could, she could trust the God who was bigger than her mind. And today, it's your turn and my turn to trust that God. And now for the third and final step in turning your bitterness into God's blessing. Thank God for who he is in your trial. As chapter 2 of 1 Samuel opens, we read, Then Hannah prayed and said, and what follows is a chorus of thanksgiving. In chapter 1, Hannah prayed silently. Remember, she wasn't speaking even though she was moving her mouth. But here in chapter 2, she unleashed line after line of verbal praise in prayer. She began by saying, My heart rejoices in the Lord. I delight in your deliverance. We'd expect her to say, my heart rejoices in Samuel and I delight in being a mother. But instead, it was the Lord himself and his deliverance that gladdened her heart. There was no trace of depression in Hannah's voice after she gave Samuel to God. The Lord was truly her treasure. She went on to tell him, there is no one besides you. That proves that Samuel had not become an idol in Hannah's heart. Some parents do place their children above Jesus in their affections, but Hannah had the Lord right where he belonged, in a class by himself. Hannah went on to pray, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. Scripture is full of people who were poor and humble, whom the Lord made spiritually rich and exalted. Joseph, Moses, Mordecai, David, Daniel, Mary epitomized this truth, as well as Hannah herself. Anyone who has blessings has God to thank for them, and Hannah was pouring out her thanks. At the end of her prayer, Hannah said of the Lord, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Hannah spoke of the Lord's king, but this was about 50 years before Israel's first king came to the throne. She also called this king the Lord's anointed, and that's the Hebrew word for Messiah. You and I know who that is. Messiah King is. And thus, in a state of prophecy, Hannah's mind looked more than a thousand years into the future as she thanked God for Jesus Christ. Throughout this prayer, Hannah thanked God not for Samuel, not for releasing her from Penina's ridicule, not for making her husband uh, understand her, not for making her a mother, but simply for the Lord himself. She knew he was at work in her trials to give her a clearer vision of him. 
How did you enjoy your heart attack? A man once asked his friend. What? I said, how did you enjoy your heart attack? Are you kidding? I didn't enjoy it at all. But I heard that because of your heart attack, you have a greater appreciation for life now. Well, uh, yeah, I guess so. And, and I also understand that because of your heart attack, you've drawn closer to your wife and children than you've ever been. Well, yes, but, and, and also that now that you've had your heart attack, you're living a healthier lifestyle than before. Yeah, but, and that it also motivated you to lose the weight that you wanted to lose. Well, yes, but, and I also heard that because of your heart, since your heart attack, Jesus Christ is more precious to you than he's ever been. Well, yes. Okay, then. How did you enjoy your heart attack? Now, I'm not saying that we should, you know, enjoy the heart attack. Even if we don't enjoy the trials, and I think that's okay not to enjoy the trials. Even when we don't enjoy the trials, we can still thank God for who he is in our trials and for the good things that he's bringing out of our trials. Now we're moving on to the action steps. I want to encourage you to make it your goal to become like Hannah in three ways. Here's number one. Ask God to use prayer as his tool to change your life. Hannah's fervent request for a son didn't convince an unwilling God to open her womb. No doubt it was the Lord's will all along to bring Samuel into this world. What then did Hannah's prayer accomplish? It transformed her heart. It was the spade that dug down to her bitterness, rooted it up, and planted joy in its place. Prayer can change you too. It can increase your trust in Christ. It can inspire thanksgiving in your heart. It can quench your anger. It can transform your bitterness into God's blessing as it did for Hannah. A growth in holiness is one goal God wants to accomplish in our prayer lives. Now for a second way to become like Hannah. Ask God to give you the right motives in your prayers. Hannah requested one son so that she might dedicate him to the Lord's service all his life. And God gave her Samuel. But later in the story, we read that the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. That's chapter 2, verse 21. We expected the Heavenly Father to have turned Hannah's bitterness into blessing by making her the mother of Samuel, but he did so much more. He gave her five children in return for the one she had given him. And as if that weren't enough, he allowed her to utter a prophecy of the Messiah Jesus Christ. Do your prayers seem to bounce off the ceiling? Maybe James 4.3 describes the reason. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. If we can pray like Hannah, selfish motives won't be a hindrance to our requests. So ask the Lord to help you pray with godly motives. And then here's the third way you can become like Hannah. Beg God for spiritual children of your own. Hannah's example suggests that spiritual reproduction should be the heart's desire of every Christian. Perhaps like Hannah, you also are barren, but in a different sense. You have no spiritual children. You've le never led anyone through the spiritual birth canal of faith in Jesus Christ. Just as Penina mocked Hannah for her barrenness, so the world ridicules the church for believing in evangelism but not practicing it. God permits this ridicule because he wants us to grieve over our spiritual barrenness. 
Where is the anguish of Hannah in the church today? Let's plead with God to cure our infertility and make our church a maternity ward for new births in Christ. If Hannah's example is any indication, God will delight to answer that prayer as it says in Ephesians 3.20, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. When our failure in evangelism becomes bitterness to us, God will turn it into the blessing of new life for others. Thank you, Lord, for this challenge today. Work in us to become like Hannah in these ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're gonna hear one more special music. going to sing a song that easily could have been written by Hannah and sung by Hannah. So I kind of invite you to think of this as Hannah's song. blessings we pray for peace comfort for family and protection while we sleep we pray for healing for prosperity we pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering Love is way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights is what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life? Are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. And we cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. Doubt your love as if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come?
Disguise. 